Hello, and welcome back to the Former Review. Today, we'll be looking at the 2021 film, Mortal Kombat. Now sit back, relax, grab your drinks, and let's talk about this movie. <laughs> What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Former Review. This is Season 4, Episode 4, and I thank you all for tuning in once again. Seriously apologize for the lateness of this episode. There's been a lot of new developments in my life, such as... If you know, you know... Which has obviously prevented me from watching the movie and then recording the analysis on it. But I'm back, and today's episode, I will be analyzing the newest video game movie and remake, Mortal Kombat. Additionally, I will be giving an update to my movie collection, my reaction to the Oscars, since it's been a while and I haven't really discussed that yet. And at the end, I will be giving my top three video game movies, so stay tuned. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions. Like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with some great sponsors that means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. And I can't wait to hear your podcast. Now, there were two big upgrades to my movie collection that I will be going into. The first one is that I was able to upgrade Zack Snyder's 300 to 4K. Now, this movie is now 13 years old, which honestly is pretty wild in itself. And at the time of this release, Frank Miller was enjoying this new career resurgence, and really, Snyder was a filmmaker on the rise. This was his second film, and while it may not have that much historical truth to it, it really established what Snyder is known for today, and that's his style. This movie has inspired obviously many men to head to the gym and work on their abs. It was shot on 35mm, but a lot of it is CGI. This may not be his best film, but I'll definitely say it's his most enjoyable. And there are probably very few people in the world who haven't used the phrase THIS IS SPARTA at least once in their lifetime. It's obviously a very quotable movie and frankly, it's full of muscles, action, and that's really it. But hey, it works for those who want to get in shape and for those who want to oogle at shirtless and attractive men who have six-pack abs. Honestly, what isn't there to love? (laughs) As I mentioned, it's not that historically accurate, and frankly, it's not even really that great of an adaptation of Frank Miller's original graphic novel. But frankly, it looks amazing and it entertains. And honestly, the graphic novel is not that historically accurate either. And if you're thinking that much about this movie, of course you're not going to like it. I haven't rewatched this yet in this format, but what has really got me excited is the new Dolby Atmos track. And I'll keep you posted on my thoughts on that. The other 4K that I got was for one of my favorite movies of all time. And that is The Sting, starring Robert Redford and Paul Newman. This is honestly one of my favorite poker movies that I really grew up watching. And there's really only one scene that has to do with poker. That's how much I like this movie. I like this movie so much that when I was younger, I really wanted to play the entertainer on the piano. And I did learn how to do that. So for those who don't know, this movie takes place in 1930s Chicago, where a young con man played by Redford, who seeks revenge for his murdered partner by teaming up with this master big con played by Newman to win this fortune from this criminal banker. So this movie was shot on 35mm and used a 4K digital intermediate. And for those purists out there, this is a true 4K movie. And frankly, I really think that the movie hasn't looked any better. It does have a lot of film grain, but the clarity is still there. Visually, this version of this movie is definitely worth the upgrade over the DVD that I had. Quite a few shots really made my jaw drop with the color and the brightness and again the clarity the audio sounded great as most 4k upgrades do but this movie isn't really known for its sound outside of its original theme so if you haven't seen this movie it is a classic film that doesn't really get old no matter how many times you rewatch it 
So the second topic I want to discuss is this year's Oscar Awards. Now, they came and went on April 25th, but for the first time in a very long time, I didn't have time to watch it. As I said at the beginning, I had to deal with a lot of personal things, especially around that date. If you know, you know. So... Back in March, I gave my predictions for the Oscars in the final episode of last season. And if you want to check that out, it's season 3, episode 56. But in short, every year I do watch all the films that have been nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and then all the acting categories. And then in some years I have time to watch also the screenplay movies for Best Adapted and also Original. Luckily this year, I was able to see all of these. And this is because the studios have had really longer than ever between the last Oscars and this Oscars to release their movies and that's 13 months starting back in January of 2020 leading up to February of 2021 to really unleash their best films and this is the longest run up to any Academy Awards ceremony in history so in short though I was right in about 50% of my picks and that's for best picture both best male acting categories original screenplay and supporting female actor though I was slightly surprised with that last one. Minna Lee Yoo Jung Yoon is very good in her role. She was my personal pick, but I didn't really think she'd win. I thought she was really just the underdog, but I would pick her over anybody. But I really thought the Academy was going to give this to Glenn Close based on her performance in Hillbilly Elegy. Now, no matter what you think of that movie, I do think that her performance is utterly fantastic. Now, regarding Best Actor, I do think it would have been a great honor to the late Chad Wooden Bo legacy to give him the award similar to what they did for Heath Ledger with The Dark Knight. Not to say that Bozeman's performance is as good as that, but he does give an electric performance that I'm sure everyone knows at this point. But then Hopkins won the award. Now I know the internet was very upset at this, but don't hate on the Hopkins performance. And if I had to guess, the majority of people did not go see The Father, and that's why they're upset about it. And honestly, Hopkins does give an amazing performance. But even if you did see it and you're still upset I think only because your favorite actor didn't win that doesn't take away from how good of a performance it was. Hopkins performance was deserving. Personally I would say Bozeman's performances in other films were overall better including the ignored The Five Bloods from last year but I digress. So Kaluuya was a pretty easy pick for supporting male actor in Judas and the Black Messiah as was Pretty Young Woman for original screenplay. While not my personal pick for Best Pitch of Minotti, I did say that Nomadland would pull through and win it all. Again, it's the most artistic movie of the year for sure, and that really can win over other really good movies. I was very surprised that McDormand won the Best Female Actor Award, though I'm not upset about it. That category was arguably the strongest category where Honestly, all of the nominees really had a good chance of winning. Personally, I did say that Day was the best, even if the movie that she was in had a lot of problems. And honestly, McDormand was at the bottom of my list, but the differences between the nominees was only so slight. And I had a similar reaction to the best directing category. Zhao winning was surprising, but not upsetting. And similar to McDormand, she was at the bottom. Though she did do a good job, I would have thought Fenno would have been able to pull out that win. Now, all of the adapted screenplay films were good when it comes to their scripts, and frankly, again, all of them had a chance of winning this. I really thought that Zhao's Powerful No Man Land, White Tiger, and One Night in Miami were the best chances of winning. The Father, I didn't think as much, and I guess was more of a dark horse, but again, it's not upsetting. So, that's my quick thoughts on that, and now on to the movie at hand. So, let's sit back. Relax, grab your drinks. Let's talk about this movie. Mortal Kombat is a martial arts fantasy film based on the video game franchise of the same name and is a reboot of the Mortal Kombat film series. It stars Louis Tan, Jessica McNamee, Josh Lawson, Tadonobu Asanu, Makad Brooks, Ludi Lin, Chin Han, Joe Tazim, and Hiroyuki Sanada. It is directed by Simon McCoy in his feature film debut, and it was written by Greg Russo, Dave Callahan, and Oren Uziel. So, 
before I go into this movie, there's going to be some spoiler warnings here, but I will try to keep it vague as much as possible, so not to ruin the movie for you, but I do suggest you watch the movie first before you hear what I have to say about it, so you fully understand everything. And also, I know I talk about this at the end, but the data shows that most people don't listen to that part, so I want to talk about it here and reiterate the importance of leaving reviews on your favorite subscription services. I do read those because I do want to grow, because these episodes are really for all you listeners out there, and I want to keep this entertaining, so what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear games? Do you want to hear more of the 4K stuff? Do you want to hear me talk about a certain movie? If you want to come on and talk to me about something for you want to debate, I'm always open to do stuff like that, so you can always reach out to me on social media. I always want to grow and improve, and just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. So, if there's something that you want me to improve on, let me know, and I will grow as such. Anyway, so, in 1992, when Mortal Kombat first hit arcades, it was most notably known for its absurd gore and brutality, and not so much the story. You pick a fighter, hit a lot of random buttons, and smack around a bunch of other people in the game, or your friend. And you're somewhat trying to save the Earth realm from the shape-shifting sorcerer Shang Tsung. Now, that story was there, but you were really there to see spines being ripped out, and hear the game say, things like finish him and fatality prior to seeing this new movie i did do a rewatch of the prior two movies and i haven't seen these films in years and i wanted to see how i felt about them now and well they weren't well received back when they were released and frankly they wouldn't be now either <laughs> The first movie came out in 95, and the sequel, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, came out in 97, and dear god does it show. This movie was pretty fun back when I first saw it. It had martial arts, somewhat cool characters, and for what I thought at the time, a lot of violence. Uh, to be naive again. I remember wanting to see this after playing so many hours on the arcade game, and my favorite players were Sub-Zero and Raiden. I will say in an updated scan of the movie, the movie did look fine, but the CGI looks absolutely horrible, and that is honestly being the nicest that I can be toward this. But frankly, it really wasn't fantastic to start with. Scorpion, Spear, Reptile, Ratings of Lightning just looked so so bad. Obviously at this point in history, CGI was still kind of gaining its footing, but Apollo 13 came out the same year as the first one, and that to this day still looks good. Even some of the backgrounds in these movies obviously look like movie sets, which they are, but when you're making a movie, if, when you do it right, you shouldn't be able to tell it's a movie set. At least from a movie that may have come off in the 90s. Maybe something back in the 1970s or earlier, but not so much the 90s. It's really a movie that couldn't be made today, at least with its casting. Raiden as an old white man is beyond awful. This I completely forgot about. I think the characters are great mostly due to the game that you that I knew ahead of time, and they could have been developed and written a bit better for the film. And some of the costumes on them were good for their time, but now they look kind of dated and don't really hold up that much. We'll say the theme is fun to hear, and no matter the cheese, and the fight choreography is fairly well done. All in all though, they aren't good movies, but they can be nostalgic guilty pleasures. The latter of the two is less so than the first. Anyway, fast forward 2010, when director Kevin Tancheron, sorry if I mispronounce that, released this eight minute short film titled Mortal Kombat Rebirth. He then pitched it to Warner Brothers to reboot the franchise. Then in 2011, they announced that he was hired to direct a new feature film from a screenplay written by him, Oren Uzio, with the intention of aiming for an R rating. Now this was originally going to be released in 2013, but then it was delayed many times. Then, Tancheron left the project in 2013, and then in 2015, the script was rewritten by Russo when he was brought on by director McCoy. And then, they began filming it, and so here we are. So, prior to seeing this movie, I did do a trailer reaction when it was released. So here are a few of the highlights. When we got there, Yo. We Dang! Scorpion! Dang! Yo! 
Yo, this is violent. Scorpion versus Sub Zero. They already know. I really hate how much excited I am for this movie. I'm honestly not expecting much, but it looks to be at least fun. So, as you can tell, the trailer definitely hyped me up a little bit. But, like I said, it, it wasn't one of those things that I was really thinking there was going to be a lot from here. But Mortal Kombat, the game series, is probably one of the few things from the 90s that is still highly regarded. And it's one of the video game franchises that really has a very, very deep catalog of film, TV adaptations, and also video games. Though what's really interesting about the newest movie in comparison to every other one of those other adaptations is honestly just how more Asian it is. And given that it is based on Ice Ninjas and Japanese Thunder Gods, this is something that you would have thought to be a good idea from the start. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So when you analyze the small details of this live action film, one can easily see the differences between it. For example, let's start with Scorpion's signature rope dart that he uses. In this movie, he uses a kunai, which pop culture usually shows as a throwing weapon. However, historians have documented that this device in Japan was a gardening tool. However, there are some stories that say that it was also used as an improvised weapon. And that's exactly how Scorpion starts using it, by grabbing it up at the moment of desperation before he's rushed by all these ninjas at the beginning of the movie. And in comparison to the first film, well, there's really no or very little explanation what whatsoever for it. And there are also a few other changes. For example, the man who becomes Scorpion is an actual ninja during the Edo period. And he has a family that's obviously going to be killed off in the first five minutes by his nemesis, Sub-Zero. Now, these rivals are played by Asian men, Sonata and Tazlim, who are respectively Japanese and Indonesian. Tazlim is also of Chinese descent. So both of these ethnicities correspond with their characters' backstories, as well as both of them being trained in their respective martial arts. To compare the other films, only a Mortal Kombat Annihilation featured an actor of Asian descent playing Sub-Zero or Scorpion, whose backstories have always explicitly stated that they are Chinese and Japanese respectively. Additionally, the film has both Scorpion and Sub-Zero facing off against one each other, speaking entirely in subtitled Japanese and Chinese. Though I'm not sure if it was Mandarin or... Cantonese, I don't know the Chinese language like that, but either way. Now, there was also some language different changing between the two when Sub-Zero slips in some Japanese to intimidate Scorpion's terrified family or insult Scorpion, and then he speaks again in a Chinese language. And after their deadly bow, this movie introduces us to another first, which is a Japanese actor playing Raiden. Now, as I already talked about, prior to my rewatch of the first two films, I completely forgot that Raiden, which is spelled R-A-Y-D-N versus the correct R-A-I. I-D-E-N is played by Christopher Lambert. You know, Tarzan. Highlander. There can be only one. Yeah, that guy plays a character that is based on the Japanese thunder god, Reijin, which I guess the defense of it is because it's a different spelling. Not really sure what's going on there. But what's really interesting about all of that, and honestly about the 2021 film adaptation, is that no one's really ever talked about these movies or video games when it comes to representation or respectful portrayal. And frankly, to my memory, no one has really brought up this series to discuss any inherent or underlying racism. Now, I'm not trying to bring that up here, but... I would like to bring to light here that the creators of this game are two white dudes from Chicago, but again, they have avoided really any racial problems, at least when it comes to the series. I don't know their actual personal life, but why is that? Now, I honestly don't know. It may be due to the main good and bad guys being Asian from the beginning, and then the diversity of all the other characters. And as such, with the majority Asian cast in this film, it almost feels like this honorable homage in a way. When it comes to the rest of the film though 
there's not really much to go off of. There are some interesting ideas that really aren't elaborated on. Liu Kang and Kung Lao are heroes that have already mastered their fighting skills. They're somewhat cocky over their American counterparts. And so over the course of the movie, one would imagine that they would have to become more humble to become the saviors of the realm. But this doesn't really happen. And even though the violence is more mature, the dialogue isn't. Now, one example of this involves Lawson's Kano achieving his arcana. So the movie states that arcana is supposed to be tied to a personal revelation. Kano gives his laser eye at the end of a somewhat racist rant that concludes with the line. And this is a quote from the actual movie. So it's really hard to take this movie too seriously. Again, the prior two movies didn't do this well either. Additionally, there could have been so much more going on between Shang Tsung and Raiden. And like I mentioned, Raiden is based on the Shinto storm god Raiden who's supposed to protect Japan from invaders. And that is something that the characters role in the games and movies has always been. But the film barely touched on that. You kind of get it, but it's... It's not really there. And even with the prior films being way worse, this item, this outing still falls short, even with its honestly accurate, gruesome deaths and over the top violence and honestly very unique representations of some of these characters that hasn't been done before. I will say that one big plus is that this film builds from that first scene to a rematch between Scorpion and Sub-Zero. And this was a good choice by the writers because each scene with the two of them is absolutely dope. These are perhaps the two most well-known characters, so to focus on that was a really good choice. And the final fight is fantastic and both actors are similarly amazing at playing their characters. Other than that though, the movie's fairly average and frankly, fairly forgettable at least from a story perspective. Then again, is much more expected from movies based on video games. There honestly has only been a few actual video game movies that are decent ones, and they are Detective Pikachu, Tomb Raider, and Sonic in that order. After that, the quality drastically drops. Don't get me wrong. I do appreciate those other movies as guilty pleasures, but they're not good movies. So, what did you think of the movie, and what are your favorite video game movies? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The formal review is on Facebook, Twitter, and the Gram, and also YouTube. The handle's all the same. It's at The Formal Review. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, I thank you very much for supporting me in that way. For anyone who wants to support, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash the minus sign formal minus sign review and click support this podcast, and any donation is appreciated. Thank you all again for tuning in, and until next time wash your hands get vaccinated and wear your mask and i'll see you at the movies thanks for tuning in to another episode of the former review cheers and we'll see you next time